Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Morton Blackwell, President of the Leadership Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our July Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. Well, I got that through, and then everybody quieted. Um, we live, is that not on? Yes, sir, now it is. Now it's on. Well, no wonder. Thank you. Um, well, I'm not talking. You can't. Why should you be able to hear me? Uh, we live in interesting times. Yes, can we not hear? Is it still not on? I can't tell you how much we paid for this uh, audio-visual uh, system. Um, state of the art, I was told. Are we now on? Is it working now? A little better. Maybe we should test this next month before we get me up here. All right? Is it working? All right, good. As I said, we live in interesting times. Much of the West, uh, as you all know, has been on fire recently. Um, enormous, hundreds of thousands of acres of, of fire. And uh, people who are knowledgeable about this sort of thing say that the principal reason for these fires going out of control is that the folks I call the uh, Echo Taliban have managed to prevent um, good uh, practices in our national forests. Um, as you know, the parks, national parks were designed to preserve pristine wilderness and the national forests were intended for wise use and, and management uh, of the forests. But uh, it, there's now a general consensus that allowing all of the undergrowth to continue to build up over time in these forests is, is just not acceptable. And uh, even some of the Echo Taliban groups are backing away from their previous insistence that, that nothing should be done in these national forests. Um, and I suppose they sense that something's got to be changed. But this morning's Washington Times contains a, 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 a mention of, a, of one of those, uh, one of those groups an Echo Taliban group uh, called the Forest Guardians, which has conceded that some forest thinning is needed to, pro uh, to protect against these serious fires. However, the uh, Forest Guardians were quoted in an, uh, in an Arizona newspaper as saying that the group supports forest thinning so long as it does not benefit commercial loggers. <laughs> And as long as the thinning is done with solar-powered chainsaws. <laughs> now, I rather doubt that there is a supply of solar-powered chainsaws, um, but uh, we do live in interesting times. In 2002, the Leadership Institute has trained 1,652 students in 83 schools. We placed. 31 job seekers through our employment placement program. Um, and you have before you at your tables our 2002 school schedule. Please take a moment to review that schedule uh, and the calendar and consider uh, attending one of our programs. As is normal in these circumstances, we now have a Pledge of Allegiance. Now, on occasion, the Pledge of Allegiance has been made by uh, by articulate and bright uh, female interns, sometimes uh, by Boy Scouts. Um, but the Pledge of Allegiance today being under uh, considerable threat, we have decided to bring in some heavyweight reinforcements. <laughs> and our Pledge of Allegiance is going to be uh, delivered by Major General Jack Singlaw. And Jack is a wonderful uh, uh, American, an American hero. Um, and a good friend of the Leadership Institute. He spent 35 years serving our country and was awarded 33 military decorations, including the Distinguished Service Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster and the Purple Heart with Oak Leaf Cluster. 
During World War II, General Singlov led a parachute mission into uh, an enemy prisoner of war ca camp on Hainan Island, which resulted in the release of 400 Allied prisoners of war. General Singlov also served in the Korean War and as commander of the Joint Unconventional Warfare Task Force in Vietnam. He was also instrumental in the establishment of several military training programs, such as the Modern Army Selected Systems Test and Combat Readiness of the Army Reserve and Army National Guard in a 10-state area, and he was appointed Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Drug and Alcohol Abuse. He and his wife, the lovely Joan, live here in Arlington, Virginia, and I am proud to present somebody who will not be intimidated and will, and will deliver the entire Pledge of Allegiance, General Singleton. <laughs> Will you please stand and join me in pledging allegiance, the full allegiance to our, our flag at this time. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Remain standing. Let us pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we ask thee to invoke thy blessings on this gathering of patriots who have already expressed their concern about the youth of this great nation and the role that they will play in the leading uh, the conflict which we must now recognize as World War IV. Heavenly Father, we ask thee to give this nation and its leaders strength wisdom and courage to make those decisions necessary to defeat the forces of evil that are striving to destroy our entire civilization. Amen. Thank you very much, General. Now my pleasure is to introduce Alex Kaufman for an update on the Campus Leadership Program. Alex works with our campus leadership program where he helps organize conservative uh, student groups on campuses in Ohio, Michigan, and the New England states. Prior to working with us at the Leadership Institute, Alex worked in Senator Rick Santorum's Washington, D.C. office. Alex has been actively involved in numerous campaigns in the past, including local and senatorial races, and he lectures at the, U at the Leadership Institute's flagship program, the Youth Le Leadership School. Alex. Good morning. It's great to see you all here this morning. Uh, we appreciate you coming. I was asked to tell you a little bit this morning about the, uh, the campus leadership program for which I work. It's a division of the Leadership Institute that seeks to help college students learn how to organize their campuses for a campaign and for conservative activism. And quite frankly, when they asked me to give this, I was, I was glad to, but a little hesitant to, to wake up this early to come in. But uh, I got a call yesterday that really invigorated me. It was from a, a student at the University of Massachusetts named Zach Spillman. And uh, I've spent many, many hours with Zach, helping him organize his campus, uh, bringing him to schools at the Leadership Institute. And he called me yesterday and said he was now a professional chicken. And it takes a little bit of explaining, but basically he was on CNN yesterday uh, as part of Mitt Romney's campaign for governor in Massachusetts where Zach has, uh, every day since the beginning of the, the campaign season, dressed up as a chicken and chased around Mitt Romney's competition for the election. And so he had a, a, about a five minute segment on CNN's Inside Politics the other day. And it was, it was really neat for me because that is, uh, that's what we've been training him to do, not to be a chicken, <laughs> actually to be the opposite of a chicken, which is what he really is. Zach attended the Youth Leadership School for the first time uh, about two years ago. I called him and told him that he would be coming, so buy a plane ticket and come down. He was hesitant at first, and, uh, but just loved the two-day program that we do called the Youth Leadership School, Morton's flagship program that's uh, trained thousands and thousands of students. But Zach has now come to four Youth Leadership Schools, a total of eight days of training, and has the innovation that he needs to be the most effective uh, youth coordinator he can be for a campaign. 
I've seen so many students, many of whom are in the room right now, uh, learn to be a really effective on their campus. The Youth Leadership School is, as we said, a two-day school. The next one is July 13th and 14th, which is this coming weekend. And basically, this is a school Morton designed many, many years ago, and it's trained Ralph Reed, Jim Gilmore, uh, Mitch McConnell, just thousands and thousands of, of young conservatives who have gone on to make a significant difference in politics. Now, Zach is just starting, but we see that he has a long way to go. And so I would encourage you, uh, if you're interested in the Youth Leadership School, it's a definitely a great opportunity for, for you or for students you may know. Uh, it can really be applicable to any age group. But uh, it deals with the real nature of politics, how to build an organization, how to canvas a campus, host a speaker, uh, just all different uh, kind of things, security and, and reaction time on campaigns. So if you're interested in this, please call us here at the Institute and uh, we, can, we can sign you up for that. We have scholarships available for students. and It's really a great opportunity for, uh, for anyone interested in becoming as, as effective as they can be on their campus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, stress that the Leadership Institute is a, an educational foundation and we are nonpartisan and we do not help candidates or political parties or political action committees, but we train a lot of conservatives who go on to help candidates of their choice. And now to introduce our distinguished speaker, I'm going to present to you Ty Bales. Ty came to us at the Leadership Institute this spring by way of Charlottesville, Virginia. In 1994, Ty attended the Institute's Youth Leadership School and used the skills he learned to become student government president at Hampton Sydney College in, in Southern Virginia. Since then, Ty ha has worked on two congressional campaigns and has volunteered for Oliver North Senate campaign and George Allen's gubernatorial campaigns in Virginia. Today, Ty works here at the Institute in our grassroots activist department where he recruits and trains conservative uh, activists to be more effective. Ty Bales. Good morning. It's a pleasure to, to be here this, with you this morning. Uh, last night, if you can believe it, it was about 90 degrees when we got out of, got out of work, left the, the office, and uh, I still went running with a friend of mine. We like to go running down at the mall, and uh, every time I'm down there, I guess being from Charlottesville, I always stop and take a break at uh, Mr. Jefferson's monument, catch my, catch my breath there, and uh, I always read those famous words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This morning we are truly honored to have a man in our presence who has dedicated his life to protecting and preserving our life, liberty, and our pursuit of happiness. Major Andy Messing Jr. is the Executive Director of the National Defense Council Foundation. He has worked on the Congressional Affairs Committee for the Department of Defense. and He, be he began his service to our country as an infantry platoon leader in Vietnam in 1967 and has received numerous military service awards including two Purple Hearts, the Meritorious Service Medal, and the Joint Service Commendation Medal. He writes numerous articles for some of our country's leading papers such as the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Times and is a frequent guest on Fox News, CNN, ABC, C-SPAN, and he serves as a consultant on defense issues for MSNBC. Major Messing also served as the Defense and Foreign Affairs Advisor to President Bush in the 2000 campaign. It's a pleasure and honor to introduce to you this morning a true American hero, Major Andy Messing. to thank uh, the Leadership Institute for this wonderful invitation and his blessing. Thank you. 
Morton, uh, it's always a pleasure to be associated with you because you're one of the champions of cogent thoughts uh, and uh, action in uh, Washington. This Leadership Institute has uh, been invaluable in educating the youth of America on democratic mechanisms and uh, you're one of my heroes. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, splendid invitation before this uh, august body. Uh, NDCF, uh, National Defense Council Foundation, uh, studies uh, conflict in, uh, as I call it, uh, small wars and drug wars. Uh, we brief members of Congress on this because uh, we go to these wars. I've been to 27 different conflicts uh, and wars worldwide. Uh, I served in uniform in three, Vietnam, Grenada and El Salvador, the latter two as a reservist. Um, I have testified before Congress. I've made appearances, uh, I made about 300 appearances on network television over the past 20 years, and um, I run an intern program at the National Defense Council, uh, which produces about 10 interns per year, and they go on to government service for the most part. Um, we do the conflict count for the Associated Press, uh, so every year, at the end of the year, you hear about how many wars and conflicts are going on. That's, that emanates from our, uh, dili uh, our diligent counting of, of all the different turmoils uh, there are in the world. And then as a sidebar, we've, done, we've put in 140 tons of food and medicine into the hottest combat areas of the world to include places like El Salvador, Somalia, um, uh, other places in Africa and Central America, and even the, the Southern Philippines. Our website is uh, www.ndcf.org, and this lists uh, 24 years of the Foundation's activities, and there are a lot of very cool pictures on there. I want to take a moment, especially on this 4th of July, to give salutations to some of my former interns. Second Lieutenant Pat Keene, United States Marine Corps. First Lieutenant Andy Chilcote, United States Air Force. Second Lieutenant Todd DiCaprio, United States Army. First Lieutenant Mike Kalazzi, United States Army. And Lieutenant Kevin Volpe, United States Navy. And then there are four individuals who are former interns that work for the CIA, and I can't give you their names, but they know who they are, and thank you very much. And then two Navy intelligence uh, civilian analysts, and they know who they are, and I can't give you their names. But these are products of my foundation. Oh, and of course, I have to recognize my own two kids, one's on an aircraft carrier going to the Gulf as we speak, a lieutenant in the Navy, uh, Eric Messing. He's a reactor officer on the USS George Washington. And my daughter, who's a drug buster on the USS uh, Venturous, or the Cutter Venturous, excuse me, that's a faux pas, on the Cutter Venturous, um, which is based out of St. Petersburg, Florida, Lieutenant uh, Camilla Messing. Then uh, I've had a lot of interns who have gone up on Capitol Hill, and, and they're too numerous to name. But these, these youth of America, which a lot of them come to leadership institute functions, um, are, are hope for the future, and, and these are the type of people that I've enjoyed trying to give my perspectives to, and uh, I just want to recognize them as they serve our country. Then um, there, are, there are all kinds of people who have served our country. They, some of them work in homeless shelters, some of them run for political office, office. some of them serve in the military, some of them uh, our police officers and firemen. But the important thing is people who serve America I recognize and I salute on this 4th of July as it comes up. Now, my, my, uh, uh, my talk for today is uh, the national security briefing I gave George Bush uh, on uh, 16 uh, July 1998. Um, I had met uh, George uh, W. Bush, who used to be called George Jr., 
back in the 86 campaign through Lee Atwater. Lee Atwater introduced me. I had been a surrogate speaker for uh, Vice President George Bush, his father, at several different uh, events. One of them was a YAF convention where I was the follow-up speaker after Jack Kemp. And Jack Kemp made a very big impression on, on the students there. And um, that was a hard act to follow. Uh, they, had, uh, they were celebrating uh, Jack because he was a quarterback for the Buffalo Bills and uh, a congressman and a, and a fantastic speaker. And he's, of course, he's a great economist. And, and it was a hard act to follow. But my, my basic remarks were that George Bush, uh, Vice President George Bush, wasn't an athletic hero. He had been the youngest combat pilot in the Pacific fighting Japanese for our liberties, to maintain our liberties. And uh, that struck a chord with this youthful audience. And when I got back to the campaign headquarters, Lee Outwater grabbed me and says, you've got to meet this guy. Uh, He's a friend of mine. He dragged me in, and I met George W. Bush for the first time, his cowboy boots on his desk. And he said, come on in, take a load off. So we had a nice discussion. And I learned then that he had been an Air Force officer in the uh, National Guard flying the, probably the worst airplane in the inventory, but he enjoyed it because it went fast. Uh, the F-102 uh, or something like that. I'm not. A, connoisseur of an uh, airplane, so uh, I think that's what it was. But uh, we had a long discussion, and, uh, and I was, uh, you know, happy to meet him. We wound up going to the Old Abbott Grill and having lunch and doing some other stuff. And then throughout the years, I maintained contact with him, going down to Arlington, Texas with my kids to go attend baseball games, and uh, just bumping into him over the years. So when... Uh, I found out uh, that he was uh, running for political office uh, um, in um, in this current elect this past election. I wound up calling up his personal secretary, who I knew, and asked if I could get in to brief him on defense and foreign affairs matters, because I knew he hadn't been briefed uh, at that point. So they gave me an appointment. I prepared a briefing paper, which is on my website and is also in your, should be in your hands. Uh, it's, it's one of the things that was passed out. I wanted to um, give him a perspective from somebody who had been to conflicts, had served in combat, who had been a funeral detail officer, and uh, who had a, some understanding of the Washington politic. So, I wound up uh, preparing this briefing, and uh, he was surprised to learn how many conflicts and, and uh, wars there were in a given year. Um, Joe Album, who's now director of FEMA, was the guy that was sitting in on the briefing, and uh, I even entertained uh, a rather hard to entertain person, Joe Album, uh, with the, the rendition that I gave. One of the main points that I discussed with uh, then Governor Bush was that there are only certain times when you should send the youth of America and send our resources and our reputation to war. And I outline this and in the first page I talk about it. To defend U.S. citizens at home and abroad, that's always a good reason. We to wind up committing American force. Uh, you can't have uh, Americans traversing this globe for business purposes or pleasure purposes or for any purpose and be threatened. Um, you know, uh, the Barbary pirates, uh, you know, had apprehended our citizens uh, in the 1800s. Uh, we threw down the gauntlet and there's been hundreds of situations where uh, we've had to protect our citizens as they traverse the planet. So that's always a good reason why we can commit American forces. To safeguard our trade routes, uh, there's um, trade routes that are choke points from here to Venezuela, down the Spratly Island chain. There's, there's uh, a dozen 
uh, key uh, trade routes that are important to us, that if they're choked off, we don't get oil, we don't get uh, the ability to ship our finished goods to countries to wind up uh, uh, getting uh, the kind of uh, remunerations into our uh, treasury and into our citizenry that we need to. Uh, so we have to safeguard those trade routes, protect U.S. marketplaces, obviously, because if we can't sell our products abroad, then that's another thing that impacts on our economy. Protect our U.S. Uh, to, to protect American resource bases is very important. The ability to get oil, the ability to get uh, titanium or, or whatever critical material we need to keep our manufacturing capabilities uh, open, uh, that's an important factor. Uh, to in, and then the, here's where it gets kind of interesting uh, because this sort of expands as America is, is, is expanding. Ensure our capabilities to manufacture, to communicate, and I have that parenthesis, especially in space. In other words, we have to protect our satellites, our commercial and intelligence satellites. Uh, the ability, we have to ensure our capability to obtain energy to farm, to mine, to fish, to produce, and protect intellectual property. That includes software now. I mean, you know, 50 years ago, we wouldn't have thought about this concept per se, even though there were copyright laws out there. Uh, but now more than ever, to protect Microsoft uh, software is, and Britney Spears' uh, uh, songs is, is an important thing because that's an in income producer to our economy. And, and keeps us in, in jobs. Um, and then um, and another reason why we have to be prepared or, or it's, a, it's allowable to commit force is to uh, proactively pursue countries, groups, and individuals who engage in proliferation of nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons. And then lastly, the, the, the uh, in my mind, uh, the permissible thing to project force, uh, put American soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines and Coast Guard people in harm's way, is to engage in sol only select humanitarian missions which, ref which reflect U.S. interests. Now there's some humanitarian interests that just don't. They don't fit that criteria. I was in Somalia and um, I thought that was very nebulous at best. Haiti I approved of, because that's right next to our shore, so to speak, and we have a million Haitian Americans uh, in our country. Uh, we have a vested interest to protect the Caribbean and Mexico and places like that. So there's humanitarian uh, reasons that I would feel comfortable committing American soldiers and sailors, etc. cetera, uh, but uh, there's some places uh, that are just uh, too far-reaching and have been done for almost specious causes. At any rate, uh, this is some of the criticisms are covered in this paper. Um, one of the things I stressed to uh, then Governor Bush was that we have to understand that you don't always use the sledgehammer right off the bat. Um, American forces have been downsized considerably over the past uh, several decades. We've gone from 2.4 million servicemen and women down to somewhere around 1.2. Uh, so, and we've had to rely on the Reserve and National Guard uh, more than ever, and we should, in some respects, because of their capabilities and their dedication. Uh, but um, a lot of these combat forces that we had that were just out there, I mean major combat forces. I remember arguing with General Shai Meyer in front of uh, uh, Jack Singlob. Jack took me in to see him and I said, look, your com 16 combat ready divisions aren't anything against the Soviet 132 divisions. And, uh, and now we're down to 10 combat divisions, and in, uh, of that 10, only like three or four are, are even ready to go. So our, our sledgehammer capability has diminished in some respect, but we seem to always be reaching for that sledgehammer right off the bat. 
there are time and place when special operations forces, the special forces, the Navy SEALs and other groups like that should be the first line of defense, the first line of consideration before we wind up uh, getting into wielding the, the sledgehammer. The concept of Colin Powell's overwhelming force doctrine that was used in the Gulf War is not necessarily applicable to certain circumstances. And uh, I uh, said that, that you should always consider special operations forces first bef and rule them out or use them as a supplement to major conventional forces before you wind up uh, just going for the sledgehammer. I was happy to see that after 9-11, five days after 9-11, he, he talked about this is a special operations war. We have to have patience. This is a worldwide war. And these are some of the remarks that were reflected from my briefing, I feel, or reflected from my briefing and other briefings that he received. Uh, I was heartened to see that because we just don't have that hardcore sledgehammer capability like, like a lot of people think. I mean, a lot of people just say, oh, not a problem, send in the Marines or send in the 82nd Airborne. Well, uh, right now we can only send in a brigade of the 82nd Airborne because they're so undermanned and under-equipped and under-trained in some respect. So we have, to, uh, we have to reconsider how we deploy major conventional forces and uh, special operations forces as part of that consideration. And this is one of the things that we talked about. Specifically, we talked about nuclear, biological, and chemical weapon proliferation. I, one of the statements I made to him is, uh, Governor, it's not a matter of uh, if there's going to be a terrorist attack on the United States on your watch, it's going to be when. And a uh, matter of fact, I had a movie that I had seen and uh, I uh, gave it to him. I had a copy with me. It's called Peacemaker. George Clooney plays a special forces officer, which I liked. And of course, no Nicole Kidman, who's not hard on the eyes. And they have this, uh, they have this uh, uh, movie out that uh, talks about terrorists uh, you know, taking a, a 0.5 kiloton nuclear device and going into New York City and trying to blow up the place. The point being that uh, that there are certain uh, feasible scenarios that he's going to have to be intellectually and psychologically prepared for, and I use that term specifically. You have to be psychologically and intellectually prepared for terrorism. And now. After 9-11, we've seen that America wasn't necessarily psychologically and, and intellectually prepared for terrorism. I think day by day we're getting to that point. Uh, and uh, in the future traumas that will come to the United States, and there will be future traumas, uh, I think America will be more prepared for it. Uh, but uh, this is one of the points I made to then the then governor. And I talked about how the, there's been a proliferation of nuclear weapons as a result of the Cold War uh, going into lukewarm and, and morphizing into a different kind of uh, uh, warfare. I talked about how former Soviet bloc intelligence and military officers and scientists were selling their knowledge, services, and even whole weapon systems on the world market. Um, I, I gave various examples about uh, how nuclear weapons and fissionable material had been apprehended by various intelligence services in countries. And um, we talked about um, how being proactive against proliferators was an incredibly important thing. I think this administration, more than the last administration, has adopted that concept of being proactive, especially after 9-11. I think they were sort of leaning forward in the foxholes, as they say, before 9-11, but 9-11 has pushed them all the way to the idea that uh, we have to be proactive. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, they, they just had an advisor resign, uh, the former four-star general um, who was head of Special Operations Command, 
and he had this uh, concept of they called the Downey Plan, and uh, about how you should use special operations forces to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Uh, I guess he read my USA Today article that was 17 February 1998 with regard to it, because that's uh, the Downey Plan was essentially this. Uh, the point is that there are certain proactive things that you must do in order to diminish conflict in the future uh, or to nullify conflict in the future. And uh, that's one of the concepts that I wanted him to understand. Um, then we talked about the rise in, in uh, terrorism. Uh, I specifically talked about Muslim fundamentalist terrorism. Uh, that had that uh, 20 years ago it was at a 5% traction. Uh, you know, 15 years ago it got up to 10% traction. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, you know, it's got up to 20% traction, and now it's got even more traction. Um, that's an important concept because obviously, if you're not taking, as General Lansdale used to say, Edward Lansdale used to say, if you have to take the cause away from the combatant or take the cause away from the guerrilla. There are a lot of things that we have done and not done that has led to us having this rise in terrorism. Uh, a lot of it is because the Muslim fundamentalist terrorists are, are so inclined uh, for various reasons, but also our inactions and our actions have accelerated that, uh, that rise in and their traction uh, within the Arab community or Muslim community and with worldwide. So, um, you know, we have to rethink how we deal with this in more creative ways. And I, I know that's kind of like a trite thing to say, but right now we're sort of in a we're locked in a situation where it's almost becoming a conundrum, and that's a bad thing. That'll lead to major conflict, worldwide conflict. Um, at any rate, we talked about that. Uh, we talked about uh, Chinese military expansion. I'm kind of horrified right now that while we're so preoccupied with terrorism, the red Chinese, the mainland Chinese, are, are making great strides uh, against us. Uh, we're sort of asleep at the switch uh, as the red Chinese military in particular, which is the tail that wags the dog of China, uh, their military intelligence police complex, um, are thinking about post-beam weapons, how to take out our intelligence and commercial satellites. Uh, the, the coming war with China was uh, written by Ross Monroe and, um, and another guy back in 19, I can't remember his name because I know Ross Monroe and we had talked. Uh, back in 19, I believe, 80, 95. Um, but since then, Timberlake and Gertz, uh, Gertz of the Washington Times, have, have written books that have documented in detail this emerging behemoth that's, that we're going to be faced with in the 21st century. And we're going to have a different type war with China. And uh, I talked to uh, then Governor Bush about this different type war. It's going to be a space, uh, air, cyber war, naval war. It won't be a land war. And in a sense, they're in an economic war with us right now as, as, we're, uh, as we're standing here. Uh, this year alone, between the three Chinas, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and, uh, and uh, mainland China, it will be $120 billion plus in, in deficit to them. Mainland China is really bending us over the barrel, so to speak, on on the uh, on economic issues right now, uh, and so we're we're in sort of like a, a warfare that we're not even com comprehending right now, and uh, at some point when they feel they're strong enough, they'll they'll segue into uh, taking uh, declaring that all the space over China is their space. And uh, if we fly over it, uh, they'll take uh, without permission. They'll take out our satellites, and that'll be some announcement in the future about that. And they will. They'll take out. Our, they'll start taking out uh, intelligence uh, uh, satellites first. Uh, they'll they know which satellites are what. 
Um, and when they do, uh, then they will segue to some commercial satellites. You can take out some commercial satellites and a couple billion dollars evaporates right there from our economy, which translates into tens of thousands of jobs. So uh, there's all, not to mention the cyber warfare acts, a aspects uh, where the Chinese military industrial intelligence complex has already been experimenting in cyber warfare activities. Uh, as indicated by all the hits they have on Pentagon sites where they've been trying to enter into Pentagon sites. Uh, but anyway, we talked about this uh, potential uh, warfare with China in the 21st century, and I, and I told him, I said, China has to be looked at as a severe competitor, as a competitor. Understand that word, competitor. They have a manifest destiny uh, that uh, that they look at in terms of hundreds of years, not in terms of five years at a clip like we do or, you know, an election cycle like we do. They, they look at things at a longer term. Uh, so, um, and then we talked about the international drug trade as part of the uh, threat against the United States. Uh, and uh, in terms of the international drug trade, uh, you have to explain that by bifurcating capitalism. Uh, I guess I'm the only institute in Washington that bifurcates capitalism into good capitalism and bad capitalism. It's that simple. Criminals use bad capitalism. Good guys use uh, good capitalism, or light. We, we refer to it as light side, dark side for the for the youth of America because they grew up on Star Wars stuff. You know, the Luke is going to the dark side. You know, all that stuff. Uh, so we refer to it as light side, dark side capitalism. I first was introduced to the concept of dark side capitalism by a drug dealer in Bogota who was a lieutenant of Pablo Escobar that I wound up getting a chance to talk to thanks to a New York Times stringer. And, uh, and he was talking about commercial this and capitalism this. And I said, wait a minute, you're a bad capitalist. And he said, yeah, but I'm a good bad capitalist. So uh, it dawned on me that there was this bifurcation of capitalism guys like uh, the head of Amway, he's a good capitalist, uh, Joe Coors, he's a good capitalist, uh, you know, uh, Roger Milliken out of uh, South Carolina, they're good capitalists, they, they, they believe in that concept that uh, Reagan articulated about the rising tide raises all boats and how uh, capitalism is, you know, can help our socio-political, economic and security well-being uh, and that it should be an opportunity uh, dark side capitalists are monopolistic. They don't go by the regulations. They uh, like to do things unobserved. Uh, it, the, the pyramid is a very tight pyramid. We're there at the top. Um, it's, you have to understand the, the bifurcation of capitalism to understand how bad the drug trade is because it's undermining good capitalism. And, and if you undermine good capitalism, you undermine democracy. So that's that's another say, that's another portion because in in, in Colombia, uh, the present uh, the current president of Colombia was Pablo Escobar's uh, senator, and he voted against extradition. And now he's president of Colombia. Now he has these sort of he says one thing in public this way, and then he goes back and does other things. So I'm not convinced that um, that. Uh, that uh, if you don't, uh, or I'm convinced that if you don't uh, attack bad dark side capitalism, uh, that uh, it, it'll impact on uh, democracy. So, so that's one of the concepts I explained to him. That's why it's important to keep going after dark side capitalists and, and drug traders, because they are criminal capitalists, dark side capitalists. And it's important to go after this dark side capitalism. Otherwise, you wind up impacting on the light side capitalism, which is what Jefferson and Monroe and Burke and uh, all those guys talked about, light side capitalism, uh, which is healthy for democracy. So it's, that's, how I def that's how I intellectually base my thoughts about going after drugs. Uh, but uh, at any rate, then we talked about how uh, what was going on in Russia at the time about how they're having a, a morphization of capitalism, dark side capitalism and communism. 
and I talked about that if we didn't introduce ethics. I, I was working in the State Department in 93, uh, and I saw all these teams going over to teach people how to uh, do capitalism. And the only group that was doing it right was Paul Weirich's group, and uh, led by Bob Kriebel, and they were talking about ethics in capitalism. In other words, light side capitalism. And all these State Department contract groups were going over there and just teaching them the, teaching them the mechanism, uh, leaving out the ethics part. And it kind of, you know that's why you have all these Russian gangs over there and you know uh, fiefdoms over there now. And it seems to me we taught them the mechanism. We didn't teach them the ethics at the time. And I told the then governor that it was important that you had to uh, convey ethics anytime you deal with any type of examples that America uses. Um, Joe Album was in the uh, meeting, like I said, and he stepped out and we talked about various other aspects. I told uh, uh, the then governor it was important for him to read Sun Tzu. And uh, you're going to chuckle when I say this, but I gave him the cartoon version. And the reason I gave him the cartoon version was not because it's simpler, it is, but because uh, it's a right side, left side hemisphere thing, you know, linear versus uh, pictorial. And, it, you, and I do this to my interns, and I find this is easier reading because there are 200 renditions of Sun Tzu in English version, or 200 versions plus, and they're very tedious to read. I mean, some of them are so esoteric and ephemeral and ethereal that I, I just can't get through it. But this cartoon version, especially because it appeals to both sides of my brain, I'm able to understand the concepts. I gave him this copy of Sun Tzu. So he was very happy with that presence. And we took some photos. And, uh, and uh, then we discussed various things, uh, various other political things. And I, and I left. It was a meeting that lasted about uh, 43 minutes. I had a great time. It's always good seeing him. And uh, I wound up talking to him three other times, one time about Ariel Sharon, uh, because he visited Ariel Sharon as governor uh, during j just as he kicked off his campaign. And he also visited a friend of mine in Texas uh, who came to visit him as uh, Fidel Ramos of the Philippines. So I felt confident that and the questions he asked me were very insightful, too. The one thing about George W. Bush is everybody says, well, he didn't have experience and he didn't do this and he was just governor for a few years and blah, blah, blah. Well, I've found that experience and osmosis is one of the best teachers. He was, he was the son of the vice president, a congressman, a vice president, a CIA director, and a president of the United States. And through osmosis, he gained an incredible amount of information. He met an incredible amount of people, and he got to converse with them in very informal, off-the-record ways to get comments and feelings from them that no reporter like Dan Rather could ever approach. So between getting briefed by people like later Condoleezza Rice a month and a half later and all these other people that he had access to especially as he became a serious candidate I could see him growing in his comments and uh, I'm very confident that he is intellectually and psychologically prepared for the task and after 9-11 it became apparent he was and it became apparent to the American people which gave me great heart um, conflict, we're always going to have conflict. Uh, it's just that way. I mean, as the world, as we just uh, went over six billion people in the world, six billion people. I have been to places like in Somalia where, as far as the eye can see, people struggling for resources, for food, for water, clean water, just clean water. And, uh, you know, as the world gets more crowded and, uh, and um, we have to compete more readily for these finite resources, there's going to be more conflict. The object of the exercise, as they say in the Army, is to 
wind up developing more resources. That's why light side capitalism is such a boon for the future. Um, and that's why we have to protect light side capitalism because it won't be restricted like it would be under dark side capitalism. Um, we, we have to understand that we have to deal with demographics. That's why I'm such a proponent of SDI, not, per, not because of SDI per se, but because it gets us closer into space. As a matter of fact, one of the things I covered and which is in this paper, paper about what if there was a future nuclear attack? Well, future nuclear attacks are normally in a different vein than we've thought about them. We always thought about, you know, uh, somebody's going to announce on the radio, in 12 minutes there's going to be a missile that comes in on the United States. Well, m the nuclear attack is actually in four phases. There's the 15 second part of the nuclear attack, which uh, Ford deployed uh, nuclear weapons by an adversary would go off in the first 15 seconds of the conflict, taking out command control communications and intelligence areas of the United States. And then we'd have SLBMs from submarines at five minutes to seven minutes, and then we'd have the ICBMs coming in, which SDI would deal with, and then we'd have airplanes come in two to six hours afterwards dropping nuclear weapons. So there's actually four phases of a nuclear attack. Nobody wants to ever deal with that first phase, which is the first 15 seconds of a nuclear war, which is, you know, 20 to 40 uh, atomic demolitions devices, or they call them SADEM, special atomic demolitions devices going off, taking out our, the, our capability to see and to hear and to feel. But um, we discussed that in, as part of it, and, I, and we talked about the utility of SDI. It, SDI is important because it keeps our research and development capability up, and it gets us closer to space. Space is a very important thing. All conservatives should be space advocates because that is a pressure valve for us in, in the 21st century especially. We should be really pushing the space program um, and that gets us closer to peace, that gets us closer to prosperity, that uh, it is an intellectual development of our country which is important. Our next manifest destiny should be we should be colonizing space. I know you, you're looking at me and going, holy mackerel, this guy's been watching too many Star Trek movies. But the fact remains that all uh, the SDI program has put has already developed like 3,500 patents that have translated into jobs, which has gotten us closer in the space. So you know, it's as I look at conflict, I look at ways to reduce conflict and adjudicate conflict, and that is as one of the glaring uh, solutions that I see. Uh, so at this time, um, I'll. Uh, I'll take some uh, questions. Oh, we also talked, one, one last thing we talked about is the uh, electrical magnetic pulse uh, attack is another form, not just a nuclear, you know, it's an adjunct of nuclear uh, attack, uh, attack on the United States, EMP attacks, which is, is, is sort of uh, a subset of, of the nuclear attack on the United States. And we talked about how EMP attacks are very cheap to generate and uh, can take out uh, a lot of our capability. But at any rate, uh, I understand I have time for some questions, right? Or, let's take three or four questions. Okay. So, yes, sir. Uh, how much done? How much damage was done during the Clinton administration by loss of uh, intelligence to the Red Chinese? Oh, geez, that's it. Oh, geez. It was, it just started with Admiral Crowley and went down. I mean, uh, he uh, wound up uh, bringing over all those Chinese and doing all that cross-pollinization of our U.S. military and the Chinese military, and we would show them everything, even to include our boxer shorts, you know, the little hearts on our boxer shorts, and they wouldn't show us very much. It, it just got, just to be absolute, it went from the sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, on how much intelligence, and plus, they can get so much from open source on us, 
And just through open source information, you can draw tremendous amounts of intelligence. Ninety percent of intelligence analysis is open source. So we're a very open society. They can draw, I mean, they had so many hits on our U.S. Army website from the Chinese military to figure out our tactics and to figure out our equipment and what our vulnerabilities were. It's not funny. So we're such an open society. It's so easy to gauge us. And 90% is a pretty good uh, accuracy measure of getting intelligence from us. And then they stole whole chunks. And the Clinton administration was just asleep at the wheel. I mean, the, uh, the whole uh, commerce part, uh, commerce, uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, they weren't doing anything to stem all kinds of uh, infractions of intelligence uh, that were going over there, technical intelligence. And the CIA was asleep at the wheel, as, as evidenced by all the intelligence failures under the Clinton administration. But, you know, here we are in the Bush administration. We still haven't fired anybody for, uh, for, for the failures of 9-11. So some of this is momentum that's carrying on. Plus, there's a lot of Clinton holdovers that are still in the Department of Defense and, and other places. Uh, I just had two emails this morning that I checked before I came here, and there were two people griping about all the Clinton holdovers that are still in the, in the Department of Defense and other places within the administration. So a lot of this inertia is still carrying on. So it's going to take uh, uh, resolve by key decision makers and, and leaders in the uh, Bush administration to try to shore up the problem that you just brought up. Another question? Yes, sir. I wonder if you could help clarify some of the discussion you've heard about nation building. Unless I was daydreaming, I thought I heard all experts like yourself, conservatives, the Governor Bush campaign at the time, criticize nation building in terms of what you say here, misusing military assets for the wrong goals. Today, anytime we talk about stabilizing Afghanistan, President Bush gets attacked as, as changing his mind. Uh, well, I was in special forces, and when you're not killing somebody, you're building, a, you're digging a well. Uh, that's oversimplification. Uh, French Foreign Legion had a concept, uh, you know, uh, use the rifle, uh, pave a road, or uh, you know, build a road. Um, the any time you use military forces, uh, other than the the security aspect. If you use them correctly and you use them focused and for our national interests to, to, to maintain trade routes, uh, resource bases, marketplaces, and stuff like this, and you, and you direct them to do humanitarian efforts that in our U.S. interests, you're using the five-paragraph field order, as they say in the military, and 90, 85 percent of what the military does keeps them tuned to doing combat operations. So I disagree with everybody who says if you're using the military for humanitarian operations, that's outside of their purview and they, and they gain nothing from it. That's, that's, a, that's a patent lie. They gain 85 percent. It, it take, for them to crank up a C-130 and take in food requires them to do X amount of planning. It's the same as taking in MREs to the same combat troops for a combat mission. Uh, combat soldiers that are out on the, the cutting edge protecting civic action guys in the civil affairs uh, contingent wind up using the five paragraph field order, which is the same thing they'd use if they were using, if they were in combat operations. So. My point is that there are time and place where military operations and humanitarian operations are good for the military because they keep them tuned up. In the case of, but you got to know when to quit, and that's the key. You got to know when the threshold is. You got to know when to pull out of Bosnia. You got to know when to pull out of Somalia. You got to know when to pull out of Haiti. You got to know when to pull out of Afghanistan. And that is the sticking point. 
a lot of times we stay too long and we become counterproductive uh, because you can't, there are 193 countries in the world, 65 of them are at war at any given time. You can't police the whole world as the United States. You have to be very focused. The imbroglios you get in or the help that you give because we don't have resources to help all 70 countries. Does that answer your question for, to, for the most part? One more. Okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> the briefing was five years ago. How do you assess the president's reaction to what he may or may not have learned from you? Well, I was – he got up and he said after five days of 9-11 said we have to have patience. This is a special operations war and it's a worldwide war. And the United States military didn't have patience. They focused on Afghanistan and the conventional military was the key element in going into Afghanistan and their motto as they painted it on the side of B-52s was bomb them back to the Stone Age, quote Curtis LeMay. So the president knew what he was talking about but the military was into the Colin Powell doctrine. They were fighting the last war, which is the Gulf War. So, and then they had a metanosis and they started moving toward actual special operations and now civic action missions and civil affairs missions. Uh, but the president understood that, but it, it wasn't reinforced. The, the military did their own thing. And now we're having all these problems in Afghanistan and we aren't treating it like a worldwide war except for a parochial effort and, uh, in the Philippines, which I applaud. And by the way, that's solely a special operations effort, which it should be. And um, so, you know, as this war on terrorism goes on, we have to continue improving our modus operandi or we're going to wind up being counterproductive in our efforts. And that group that I talked about earlier that was 5% 20 years ago, 10% 15 years ago, 20% 10 years ago, is going to reach a point where they're over the 50% threshold in one-fifth of the world. And then they'll use the nuclear weapons and the chemical weapons and the biological weapons because their constituency will not condemn them and they will not wind up uh, ostracizing them or giving them assistance or a base or ignore them. And that is the scary thing that we have to deal with today, 2 July 2002. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. We much appreciate your sp uh, spending time with us and sharing your uh, your, your views and analyses uh, with us. Um, people do like to leave with little presents, and so I'm going to do for you as we do to our uh, speakers here, pre present you with a, with a little present. Uh, and uh, it's particularly appropriate because this, it's an Adam Smith tie who certainly was a uh, philosopher from, from, the, from, from the light side of, uh, of capitalism. And Adam Smith Tide. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and uh, Adam Smith did not uh, neglect the ethical component of it because he was, after all, a professor of moral philosophy uh, in Scotland. So we'd very much appreciate your coming and uh, invite you to come back and join us uh, the first Wednesday of, of every month. Invite everybody here to come back for our next Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast, which will be Wednesday, August 7th, where our speaker will be Mr. Neil Freeman, who is president of something called the Blackwell Corporation, and there's no relation uh, to this Blackwell, but he's an excellent uh, man and a real uh, a pioneer, uh, activist, and cutting edge activist for conservative principles and has been for decades. You all will enjoy Neil Freeman next month. Thank you for coming. <laughs>